My first great love in terms of civilizations were the Aztecs. And I grew up in New Mexico and Arizona on the Navajo Indian Reservation. And one of the tales that was told to me as a child was that of the massacre of Canyon de Chez. Canyon de Chez is this very beautiful canyon. And the Indians had retreated to some caves high up in the walls. And the white men had shot into the mouths of the caves and the bullets ricocheted and killed everyone within the caves. So it was always this tale of the destruction of the Indians by the white men. So when I, in high school, was reading about the conquest of Mexico and Bernal Diaz, his description, when the Spanish first crested over into the mountain pass, looking down into the valley of Mexico, where you had the capital city of the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan, in the middle of this lake with these straight causeways glittering in the sun because they were polished white stucco and these temples rising up and the city was surrounded by floating gardens where they grew flowers and produce. They'd never seen anything so beautiful in their lives. It was, you know, like a fairy tale, like a dream. And the city was very, very clean, unlike the Spanish cities, which were stank. Europe had no sanitation at all, no sewers, no nothing, so you could smell them for miles before you got to them. Whereas the Aztecs were meticulously clean. They bathed themselves twice a day, and this, they had ways of dealing with sewage and things like that that the Europeans did not have. With the Aztecs, you have to grapple with the whole concept of human sacrifice, which is so alien to our mindset. And as a child, of course, I was delighted in its gruesome aspects. And as an adult, I find I'm still fascinated by the Aztecs. And that's one of the sort of paradoxes. How do you have this incredibly sophisticated civilization that was capable of a very high standard of living compared to Europe, and this brutal religious rite? One of my early purchases a number of years ago was an Aztec sacrificial knife, which is simply a blade in white flint. It doesn't look like much. Originally, it would have been hafted to a wooden handle, and sometimes those handles were covered with mosaics and made quite, you know, beautiful. But the idea is you could hold it by that handle. There's only one sacrificial stone that I know of that survives in the National Museum in Mexico, because the Spanish, of course, destroyed them when they came across them. And they're fairly low affairs, you know, about knee height, maybe a little higher, with a slight concavity in the top. And you would take the victim and have him, of course, assistance. You had to have a few people doing this. Bend the body over, arch the back, so they could, the chest was really brought up like this. Then slice just below the sternum with this knife and then reach in with your, with the priest would reach in with his hand and rip the heart out. And then take the heart and offer it to the God and burn it. It's an offering to the gods. Last year I finally went to Mexico City, which I avoided out of just ignorance and fear, despite my fascination with the pre-Columbian civilizations. And the National Museum in Mexico is truly, you know, one of the world's great museums, if not the world's greatest museum, certainly for what it presents. And there is a lot of Aztec sculpture. And the sculpture rekindled, you know, my love and wonder at the Aztecs. I mean, it's, it's very alien. It's a com coming from such a completely different place than Western aesthetics. Um, one of the great sculptures in it is a statue of Coatlique, which is the mother of the gods and of all life. And she's depicted as this terrifying, you know, beast. Of two, her head is two serpent heads. Her Every part of her is animated with serpents. Her, it's, her name literally means skirt of serpents. So it's like woven serpents in her skirt. Her hands end in huge claws. She has, you know, exposed human breasts with a necklace of severed hands, hearts, and a head in the middle. One of the things about art, and one of the reasons I love the art of other cultures, and I think the challenge of looking at, let's say, the Aztecs, because it is a challenge, 
is I think art communicates on nonverbal levels and it's reaching I mean these are archetypes we are all human beings and snakes are both the object of fascination and fear and here you have this being who is made of snakes and not just garden snakes they're they're snakes with like huge fangs you know and 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 they looks like it could all just turn upon you and rip you to shreds and I think that that's part of the power of the image and I think that it was it probably felt the same way to them as it does to us only it meant something different to them and human sacrifice is so sort of in your face but it has a context it's ritualized it has there's a meaning to it it wasn't pointless their belief system necessitated human sacrifice in order to keep the cycle of life going. It was thought that the, the gods required the blood of humans in order to nourish them, to keep like the sun going up, rising in the morning. And the reality is, the ancient Americans had no large animals. There were no bulls to sacrifice, or horses, or other large beasts of burden, unlike in the ancient let's say classical world where sacrifice was a regular part of worship but they sacrificed bulls or animals. I think death is sort of like the great question of life. I mean we're all we all die and so there's this and I think in our culture we tend to sort of shy away from that and we you know try to keep it at a distance and not think about it and not address it but there is a human fascination with it and you think of one of the most popular forms of entertainment, other than porn, is horror movies. I mean, you know, and what happens in a horror movie? It's horrible things. <laughs> and yet, we love them. <laughs>